To me, Randport was a wonderful place to be. Whites and blacks and other nationalities, we were all in school together. It was integrated. We were true friends. There was no if, ands, and buts about it. There was no discrimination as far as I was concerned. We had a community center, a theater. We started a college, Portland State. Portland State was born in Vanport. Wow. There were more people that looked like me in my neighborhood than whites. You know, there's so much about Portland. Mm -hmm. So much. Um, am I on camera now? You can speak openly on camera. I can edit it out. If it's I too know strong. you can. <laughs> do you want? Do you want a bit also or not? Yeah, please. What were you going to say about Portland? No matter what happened, I love Portland. It was my home, and I met some good people. I moved into Portland with my family, my dad, my mom, my sister, and my brother. After the flood of Vanport, which was in 1948 on Memorial Day, being dislocated like we were, it was very confusing. I was 16 when the flood happened. We had no home, no clothes, no nothing. And it's hard trying to remember things that hurt. God just don't want me to remember. Fortunately, my family was saved and we were taken to Boyce's school. And the, the only thing I can remember there is being told that we would get a typhoid shot. I don't know where my parents were. I didn't know where my sister and my brother were. I don't know if I walked into Portland or I went in somebody else's car. That is all gone. We were at Giles Lake and we were given two trailers to live in. They were small. My mom and dad lived in one and we three children lived in the other one. They were side by side. But my dad was working and was fortunate to buy a house. 3217 Northeast Rodney Avenue. We were in the Washington School area. My sister had gone to Roosevelt High School from Vanport, and I had wanted to go to Roosevelt High School. Of course, they told me I had to go to Washington High School. That was very disheartening. It, it was very difficult for me just being ignored. It was mainly being ignored by my teachers. They seemed not to care whether I did my schoolwork or not. They seemed not to want to help me. Um, there were 12 of us at Washington High School. We didn't talk about it, probably because we were leery of, you know, saying anything. I was the only black student in all my classes. It was just very, very difficult. When I think back on it even now, I get teary. Mm -hmm. um, after the flood, that's where redlining became very obvious. Black people could not get loans or anything. And if you lived in the red line district, you were more apt not to get a loan. How my dad got his house, I don't know. He probably saved money so that he could uh, pay down on it. All my neighbors on Rodney within the square block were black. We are more comfortable mm -hmm. around our own people. After the flood, blacks lived from the Willamette River to Fremont, from 7th Avenue to Interstate Avenue. And I was happy. I, I was happy in my neighborhood. I was either 17 or 18, and I had a babysitting job. Not in my neighborhood. They were white, and they had this adorable girl, Diane. Well, Diane uh, had her little friends over, and 
They were in the front yard and they were playing. They all grabbed hands and they were going around in a circle. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a nigger by the toe. I, I never said a word to them about the song. But when Mrs. came home after work, I told her I was quitting. And I told her about the song. And I was crying, I think because I really, really cared about them and their little girl. But I felt like I cannot work here if they're teaching their little girl discrimination. That song hurt me so bad. Her words were, oh, you can't quit. And I looked at, and I said, oh yes, I can quit. I just did. After the flood of Van Port, there was black business on Williams Avenue. There was the market, restaurants, hot dog places, hamburger places. They were there, and they were owned by black people. Paul's Paradise, it was a very popular place. As a matter of fact, Sammy Davis Jr. was here, and he played at Paul's Paradise. So we would be in there dancing and having a good time. Then we'd go across the street to Citizen's Restaurant, which was a little restaurant that my brother-in-law owned. And then up the street was the Tropicana, another little cafe-like place. I got married and I left Portland in 1956, and I was in Los Angeles. And during the time I was there, I would talk with my sister or she would write me a letter and they had problems. They found a, an apartment that they wanted, but it was not in the Red Line District. They called, made an appointment. A woman opened the door and she saw they were black. And her words were, oh, I just rented that apartment. How can you tell someone, oh yes, we have this apartment, you come over and I'll be happy to show it to you. They show up maybe half an hour later and the apartment is rented. It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. I lived in Los Angeles for eight years. Mm -hmm. I did not feel any discrimination. We could go wherever we wanted. However, coming back to Portland, I did feel it. Williams Avenue was basically, there are no black businesses. I-5 came through and disrupted people. The Lloyd Center had been built. That was just a gentrification. What happened to all the people that lived in the neighborhood? I can simply imagine they moved farther north within the community. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the Coliseum was built. People of color lived in that area, mm -hmm. and they were all disrupted. Their lives were disrupted. Where did they go? And the next move was in the early 70s. Emanuel Hospital, that was a black community. Model Cities was a program. Supposedly, they would give money mm -hmm. to develop whatever a neighborhood wanted. The black people did not get the money. Mm -hmm. Agencies, businesses got mm -hmm. it. Emanuel Hospital got a big chunk of it. Mm -hmm. People were displaced. And I believe at that time, they were probably starting to build Gresham. Of course, the house is new. Mm -hmm. People are going to like that. They have their garages that you can just pull into and go right into the house. All of that looked good. So people moved to Gresham, not thinking about the transportation. The effect is there is no black community. Not now. People who make all these decisions they don't have to worry. Gentrification has been there for a very long time. It's just now becoming more public knowledge or people talking about it. They have actually destroyed our neighborhood. 
It feels like I have no place I can go within the north northeast area. I felt like, where am I going to go? I don't have any money. I can't afford to buy. The rent is very high. I was disappointed. I felt displaced. And even today, I am disappointed when I drive down Williams Avenue and Vancouver Avenue. I don't live in Portland now. I live in Vancouver. It, it's a very bad feeling, a very bad feeling. You know, I hear what she's saying about being around when, you know, we grew up, really, I grew up in, in two kind of different worlds because living in California for a period of time, I was born there. Mm -hmm. And then coming here, um, the communities are so different. That was fairly traumatic. Long story short, I was bused from Humboldt to Kenton, a school that did not want us. So it was kind of the same thing with my mom with being at, in high school. But um, so those memories are, um, you know, uh, not so pleasant. That was probably for me the start of the disintegration of the community because mm -hmm. you no longer knew the kids in your own neighborhood mm -hmm. that well. I remember um, having to get up very early and I was never an early morning child because <laughs> the bus just didn't take you from your neighborhood school and and take you straight to the mm -hmm. school. You always had to make the rounds. So you went to other schools to pick up kids, drop off kids. And um, <clears throat> those were not pleasant situations because they would spit at the bus, they would call us you know, terrible names. I was telling my son actually, I said, yeah, I didn't even know I was a nigga until I came to Portland. When mm -hmm. I was in California, I didn't, you never heard that, that I remember. I thank God that I had a, an older brother because I always felt like my older brother, George, protected me. And, you know, so, feeling like you um, don't have an anchor, you know, you, you lose a sense of who you are, a sense of yourself, you know, and you really have to actively seek that out. You have to be more intentional about even keeping your own black friends. They don't live around the corner. They don't live down the street. You don't go to the same church. You don't see them at the store anymore and because they're in a completely different area. So you just kind of lose track of people. 